Hi, I'm Suna Jane from The Ohio State University, uh, the American Association for Hand Surgery. Would like, to, uh, would like to welcome you to our Hand in Hand combined webinar series with the uh, Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America today. And I would like to introduce you to our moderator, Andrea Bauer from Boston Children's. Andy, take it away. Hi, thank you so much. And um, thank you for everyone who is joining us tonight. Um, we are going to start at the fingertip and work our way up to the elbow and then talk about some rehabilitation techniques. Um, so in the interest of time, because we have a lot to go over, let's just dive right in. And so I'd like to introduce Dr. Aaron Berger. Um, he will be talking about pediatric fingertip injuries and he's coming to us from Nicholas Children's in Miami. I think um, you can, sh oh, we're not sharing video yet, I guess. Huh? Okay. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Thank you, Andy. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. And I, I want to thank the conference organizers for allowing me to present on fingertip injuries. I have no financial or other disclosures relevant to the presentation. Our goals here are to define the anatomy of the fingertip, review the causes of fingertip injuries, describe the evaluation of fingertip injuries, and summarize the management of fingertip injuries. There's several references and resources available that are much longer than this talk will be, my favorite of which is that by Marty Posner, uh, in which he gives a thumbs up and a thumbs down to his favorite flaps and otherwise. So I think it's probably best to start by defining the fingertip. And it's essentially all structures distal to the insertion of the flexor tendon and extensor tendon on the distal phalanx. Um, we can go over the uh, glossary of terms here, essentially the hyponychium is the distal, most distal portion of the fingertip at the end of the nail bed. The sterile matrix and germinal matrix make up the nail bed, and the uh, germinal matrix contributes to 90% of nail plate production. The unula, that small moon at the proximal aspect of the nail bed, is the distal part, the visible part of the germinal matrix. Uh, I'm hoping that this is helpful for um, all of you who already know everything in this talk, and that is that fingernails are really unique to primates. <clears throat> and it's not entirely clear that what selective pressures led to the development of our fingertips in their current form. It's believed that fingernails and broad-based finger pads probably developed for improved prehension in a lemur-like ancestor that needed to grasp small branches. And uh, lemurs actually do retain at least one grooming or toilet claw. The loss of the grooming claws is probably a reflection of more complex social networks and increased social grooming. The functional significance of fingernails goes without saying. They're great for scratching. Um, uh, but I think probably most important is that they provide counter pressure for the pulp of the digit, facilit facilitating prehension and tactile sensation. The nail plate's made up of keratinized tissue. It grows at a tenth of a millimeter a day, and there's usually a 21-day lag after injury. Three to four nail growth cycles are, are essential to maximal improvement in appearance. The etiology of fingertip injuries in our patients generally uh, come from crush injuries, lacerations, or amputations. There are several classifications uh, schemes that have been um, described. The classification by Allen is based on the level of amputation, the fastler systems based on the geometry of pulp loss and whether bone is exposed. Both systems are useful for communication and documentation, but have limitations in guiding treatment. The Tamai classification is useful in um, it's based upon vascular supply and it's useful in uh, defining uh, replantation <clears throat> or planning replantation. Uh, I thought we would start with subungual hematomas in which um, x-ray evaluation is essential to assess, assess for fracture, especially Seymour fractures. And it's generally believed that if less than 50% of the nail plate is involved, you can observe. If greater than 50%, uh, the recommendation is to drain remove the nail plate, address any open fracture, and repair the nail bed, as well as stent the epinicule fold open with or without a splint. Uh, though I don't know that this is always necessary. Distal, and I think looking at the x-ray helps to make that, dis that determination. Uh, distal phalanx fractures can be described as tuft, shaft, or base fractures. And again, base fractures, it's important to think about Seymour fractures as in the one that's uh, shown on the at the bottom of the screen. It's helpful when radiology tells you that the tip of the middle finger has been uh, broken off. Uh, but I do think that x-rays are helpful for uh, looking for underlying fractures. 
So again, with respect to management of fingertip amputations, x-ray is essential. Uh, if the part is available, consider composite grafting or replantation. If the part's not available, the options include occlusive or semi-occlusive dressing changes, especially if less than uh, 1.5 centimeters uh, in size and there's no exposed bone. Skin grafts can be considered, though they're not necessarily recommended. Acellular dermal matrix, uh, flap closure, and revision amputation. Composite grafting includes thinning the part and replacing it with absorbable sutures. My favorites are 5 Vicro Repeat and 5 or 6 uh, Plain Gut. And um, as in Dr. Posner's uh, talk, do not simply reattach the evolved skin pulp and bone as a composite graft. It's important to remove the bone and some pulp tissue. And, it, and it's important to prepare the family for the possibility that this may very well become a, a biological dressing. Uh, replantation can be considered when the amputation is more proximal. But I think in these situations, it's important uh, to recognize that this is often a very distal and crushed part with a low likelihood of success and to talk to the family about the possible need for leech therapy or bleeding. Um, with respect to these distal um, uh, replantations, especially in the older patients, um, <clears throat> This is one technique that can be used to help with um, performing both the arterial and venous anastomoses. An additional technique from described from Japan includes talking to the family about coming back eight to 12 hours later after doing your arterial anastomosis to find that you've had an engorged digit. You bring them back at, at eight hours later, and it's much easier to find that uh, vein and perform your anastomosis later. Conservative treatments, uh, a very viable option here from Dr. Toss in um, Milan, describes shortening the bone and then using an occlusive dressing and expecting healing within five to six weeks. This is a paper out of Switzerland describing uh, results with semi-occlusive dressings for fingertip amputations and showing a very good quantity and quality of soft tissue regeneration. For those of us who are... Um, uh, motivated to perform a skin graft, please keep in the back of your mind that um, the pa in this study from Denmark, they were able to show that uh, patients who had healed by secondary intention had better results, more aesthetic outcomes, and improved sensibility when healing from secondary intention over grafting. And I think if you're thinking about grafting with a, a full thickness skin graft, it's important to think about the, uh, the organelles within this uh, skin at the fingertip. This is just a plug for my favorite skin graft donor site. If you're inclined to perform skin grafting, my personal preference has been to harvest full thickness skin graft from the ulnar aspect of the hand at the junction of glabrous and non-glabrous skin. I've found this especially useful in syndactyly cases in which uh, I don't, if I don't need a ton of skin. Uh, these are an, some of the acellular dermal matrix products which have been described for fingertip uh, amputation reconstruction and good results have been reported with many of these. Uh, this is another study out of Switzerland comparing semi more recent, comparing semi-occlusive dressing therapy to surgical treatment of fingertip amputation injuries, in which they showed that 100% of the patients who had undergone semi-occlusive dressing treatments healed at 17 days, whereas the surgically treated group, in 28%, they had flap necrosis. Uh, so they found better clinical outcomes, lower complication rates, and significantly higher patient satisfaction rates in those patients treated with semi-occlusive dressings. And they now prefer surgical options only in situations with exposed flexor, extensor tendons, or with ex ex large portions of exposed bone. Flap reconstruction. I mean, there are several options for flap reconstruction of fingertip injuries. The goals are to have a well-padded bowler skin, good sensibility, and avoiding the development of a hook nail deformity. And part of this involves not only preserving bone length, but also closing with volar pulp tissue and not the sterile matrix. If the sterile matrix ends up rolling over the end of the tip of the finger, that's really what, what leads to the development of, uh, of hook nail deformity. And the distal end of the sterile matrix should terminate two millimeters from the tip of the bone. This is a catalog of the lo local flap options available for fingertip coverage. We're going to go through each one really quickly now. So volar advancement flaps, the Moberg flap, is really mostly suitable for thumb tip injuries. In the fingers, when considered, you need to terminate or stop your dissection at, at the level of the PIP joint because any proximal to that, you run the risk of skin necrosis over the dorsum of the digit. 
VY advancement flaps come in essentially two varieties. The lateral VY flaps, the cutler flaps are really only good for the tip of the, the really small segment uh, defects at the tip of the finger. And the volar VY flaps, the Addisoy and Kleiner flap uh, is better uh, coming from the volar aspect. This is Dr. This is from Dr. Posner's talk showing uh, that the cutler flaps really provide, in his opinion, poor padding, a midline, oftentimes tender scar of the fingertip and are only indicated within three to four millimeters of the tip. The Kleiner flap, he gives a thumbs up to. Um, and though I, I've had um, issues with the Kleiner flap as well, sometimes leading to uh, hook nail deformities or, or on the verge of hook nail deformities. And Dr. Toss has, pre has shown that if you put a, uh, a needle through the flap or a pin, it helps take the tension off and prevents the development of, of hook nail deformity. This is just a representation of the thenar flap and the outcome to be expected with the thenar flap. I have yet to find any literature on the hypothenar flap. You know, the thenar flap is is really a good flap for uh, index and middle finger uh, tip reconstruction. However, it's hard to get the pinky over there. Uh, this was a patient who had presented to us late. In fact, it was the patient that presented with that hook nail deformity that I demonstrated. And this just shows this patient. He also had had, um, and this is at the time of section showing a bleeding flap and the antenna procedure for correcting hook nail deformity. Pearls for cross finger flaps, including hinge, a hinge at the mid axial line, preserving peritinon over the extensor and waiting three weeks before sectioning the flap. This is a patient shared by M Mike Galvez from uh, Valley Children's showing a patient with uh, exposed uh, FPL and bone and uh, getting it covered with a uh, cross finger flap from the index finger. Could have also been done with the first dorsal metacarpal artery flap, which is sensate. And these are some of the neurovascular island flaps uh, that have been described. If patients are inclined, toe pulp transfers can be considered microvascular toe pulp transfers. Uh, and uh, this is a patient, this is my last uh, my last couple of slides, just showing a patient who presented to us who I had initially thought might be a candidate for a thenar flap. Uh, he had presented to us and was on his way to Mexico, uh, but the night in the week he had, he was on his way to Mexico the day before he came to our clinic. Uh, he a week prior, he had crushed his index finger with a sixty pound dumbbell. And uh, according to the patient and his mother, that this the part that they reattached or the part that they had sewn back on did have uh, pulses on Doppler, but ultimately necrosed. So we went to the OR with a plan for a possible thenar flap or revision amputation. I think it's important to talk to patients about this. And we were able to find the neurovascular bundle in that mummified part and perform a traction neurectomy. The distal portion of the distal phalanx was not as good in person as it looked on x-ray. And once we had performed debridement of obviously necrotic bone. Uh, he was ultimately uh, he ultimately underwent revision amputation. So for revision amputation, I think it's important to shorten the bone sufficiently, excise the germinal matrix, and in order to do this, you have to visualize the insertion of the extensor tendon. Traction rectomy goes without saying, and uh, preserve to the best of your ability the insertions of the flexor and extensor tendons. And uh, again, with excising the germinal matrix, making sure that you see the insertion of the extensor tendon to prevent that uh, nail horn uh, development. Just briefly, Seymour fractures are, are fractures that occur at the physis and the germinal matrix becomes interposed. Uh, they need a lateral x-ray to make the diagnosis. The nail plate often lifts out of the epinicule fold and untreated, these can go on to infection, growth arrest, and mallet deformity. Uh, the treatment involves making two diagonal back cuts to identify the germinal matrix repair, debride the fracture, repair the germinal matrix, and then fixate the bone with a K-wire. Mallet deformities can typically be treated in a splint. A surgery may be needed depending upon intra-articular, the intra-articular component in the presence of volar subluxation. So in summary, pediatric fingertip injuries are common. The goal is a painless fingertip with durable sensate skin. Most can be treated with a composite graft or healing by secondary intention. If there's a large area of bone or tendon exposed, consider flap reconstruction or revision amputation and try to keep it simple. Thanks. Thank you. That was wonderful. Um, and as we're pulling up, um, 
Dr. Goldfarb's slide. So um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Charles Goldfarb. He'll be talking about pediatric hand fractures um, uh, coming to us from St. Louis Children's. Um, and I just have one quick question for Aaron before we um, before we get started with that. And that's, um, you know, I really liked the amount of uh, depth you went into for the composite graphs and, and the occlusive dressing. What percentage of pediatric fingertip fractures, do you think you're actually doing something besides that, besides a composite graft or a, or an occlusive dressing? In my practice, it's pretty rare. I think, uh, I think it's hard to justify sometimes. And I think, you know, especially, and I think it's really dependent upon the age of the patients. So I think all those patients less than five do really well with composite grafting. The older kids are more like adults, especially the teenage kids. Um, but even then, so like in that patient, that last patient that I presented, um, they start to grow. It's almost as if you're treating it like a frostbite type injury and let them grow some or re-epithelialize beneath there and see what they get. Um, yeah, no, those are really great pictures. Um, thank you. All right, Dr. Goldfarb, take it away. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Bauer and Dr. Berger. That was awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, my topic is pediatric hand fractures in 10 minutes or less. Um, so, you know, kids generally make us look good, but they don't always. And I'm going to show some of the ways things go wrong. Um, I am in St. Louis. I do work with Acumed and I'm lucky to work at two great children's hospitals. So first I'm going to share some general principles and then I'll show some examples um, so pediatric hand fractures are different from adult fractures, right? Because of the physis and because of the way the fractures occur periarticularly. There is a general tendency to assume because this is a kid, everything's going to be fine. But the reality is, while that may be true for many, it's not true for all. And we have to be aware of potential sequelae to hope, hopefully to avoid them. So I think a four considerations when I address a kid's hand fracture. The first is that sometimes they are, or not sometimes, a lot of time, at least in the Midwest, they, de they are delayed in presentation. Parents may overlook the fracture. The child may not mention it to the parent, or they may go to urgent care or the emergency department, and it may be overlooked there as well, or, or simply underplayed. Um, the diagnosis can be difficult um, because the examination in a young, unhappy child is challenging and even obtaining the right radiographs is challenging. And so you really wanna understand is there a rotational component? Is that swelling? Is that a bony abnormality? And even getting the right X-ray, the X-ray on the left uh, shows a very subtle fracture, but you don't have uh, the good lateral X-ray to really understand the fracture, you can underestimate it. We, and that definitely includes me at times, have unreasonable expectations about what will heal, how quickly it'll heal, and what can remodel. And then of course, there's a the challenge with treatment and compliance. Many kids will not tolerate a simple splint. Uh, casting needs to be used more frequently. So why do I worry? I worry about a lot of things a lot of the time. And these are some of the reasons that I worry about these quote unquote simple fractures, so angulation, rotation, growth plate damage, um, avascular necrosis is probably my biggest worry, stiffness, infection, et cetera, et cetera. And so angulation, can be subtle or can be not so subtle. And, you know, our goal when we assess these children is to, you know, do the assessment in a timely fashion. That might not be on the first time you see the child. So if you see the child, they're significantly swollen, then you might bring them back a week later. You might cast them, bring them back a week later and reassess to understand what component is swelling and what component is a bony issue. Rotation similarly can be a subtle abnormality or a dramatic abnormality, and one family will treat this completely differently than another family, or I should say one family's expectations from you, the treating physician, will be different than another family's. And so understanding what the expectation is matters. Understanding hobbies can matter. Physeal closure is actually not something I worry a great deal about. Of course, every child with a uh, injury near the growth plate and who goes to urgent care or the emergency department is is warned about this. I don't spend a lot of time talking about it, although occasionally it can happen, obviously. 
Avascular necrosis is one of my biggest concerns. I worry about it with the subchondral fractures, um, and I sometimes alter my treatment uh, because of this risk, because this is devastating. And anything we can do to avoid this complication, we should do. Infection and osteomyelitis, you know, most notable with the Seymour fracture that Aaron so deftly discussed. Um, that's when I see this most commonly, but of course we can see it anywhere. So when we have displaced fractures, we have to consider what will remodel. So sagittal plane injuries most have the best chance of remodeling when they are in the plane of motion. The fractures that are close to the growth plate and obviously younger patients have a greater ability to remodel. Rotational abnormalities and coronal plane abnormalities probably will remodel a lot less. This is a pretty typical thumb fracture, Salter Harris II, that really has no functional significance to the patient if we allowed it to heal like this. This is one of those fractures that we talk about with the family and help them make the right decision for their child. Um, this is a great series of uh, x-rays showing a subchondral fracture, which remodeled over time. Uh, this is a long way from the growth plate, but in a younger child, a five-year-old child or six-year-old child, remodeling can happen as long as the patience uh, of the family is not expired by the time the remodeling occurs. Um, growth plate injuries, you know, we all see them. Uh, the extra octave fracture is most common. I think in our practice, that fracture plus the Salteris uh, two or three of the base of the thumb proximal phalanx are the most common uh, physeal injuries that we see. A lot of times these can be treated successfully in the emergency department. And our typical strategy is uh, obtain an anatomical reduction, the ED, buddy tape, cast, see them at a week for x-rays in the cast, and then hopefully take the cast off at three weeks or so, and then assess them clinically um, rather than trying for the early exam. And obviously with these fractures, we worry about angulation. So a typical couple of examples, and here's another example. This is that um, Salter Harris II, or perhaps an extra physeal fracture at the base of the thumb proximal phalanx tree with the close reduction and pinning. Here's an extra octave fracture. I think these are relatively straightforward to treat in comparison to say the subcondylar fractures, which I'll show you in a bit. Um, but these anti-grade K-wires, and sometimes I'll go, I'll use only one K-wire. We always talk about two K-wires to prevent rotational issues later, but sometimes one is sufficient. Juxtify seal fractures, I treat the same way I may treat a Salter Harris II fracture. Um, and so these need a reduction. If it's stable, that can be sufficient. If not, uh, then we add K-wires. Articular fractures in the child are different than they are in the adult. Those can be the bony gamekeeper fracture, the metacarpal head fracture, and the union bicondylar, bicondylar phalangeal head fracture. And of course, we worry about the joint. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen arthritis develop after one of these fractures, but that's what I worry about. So this is quite common. Um, the fracture is always bigger than you think it is. Um, and it's always more rotated than you think it's likely to be. And so in these fractures, we not uncommonly go to the operating room for an open reduction in internal fixation. And uh, that's almost always with K-wires that, that we then remove. Two K-wires is usually sufficient. Type of metacarpal head fracture. Uh, some of these do just fine, but some of them need more careful treatment to avoid impingement with range of motion. And a fracture like this, an un untreated bicondylar fracture is really problematic. And the key with late treatment of these is avoiding that risk of AVN by creating a long oblique osteotomy. This is a patient with a very subtle P2 head fracture uh, that was uh, originally labeled a sprain. And this is tough. To me, there was a clinical deformity and I worry about this fracture over time. You can see that it's a, really a fracture subluxation. And so we treated this with, a, with a, an open reduction and pinning, but we took great care not to devascularize that fragment. So these fractures have been labeled different things, subcondylar fractures, cartilaginous cap fractures. Um, we know that the condyles are not fully ossified, so we can underestimate this fracture. And many, if not most of these go dorsally and understanding a true x-ray really matters. And so 
you know, yes, these deserve to be treated when there is significant displacement, especially in an older child. Uh, but we do worry about creating AVN if we're too aggressive with our treatment. Uh, we all know that the problem with this fracture is the lack of the subcondylar recess, which allows maximum flexion. And so restoration of that recess is the goal with surgery. And that can be closed reduction and typically is closed reduction and pinning uh, with retrograde wires. And that is can be somewhat tricky, especially with trainees. Um, sometimes there is also a deviation in ulnar direction, especially with the little finger. And so correcting that matters. This is one of the tricks that Lindley Wall taught me, um, trying to keep the K wires out of the collateral ligaments. And so driving these proximally, exiting proximally, uh, really does a good job of maintaining fracture alignment and it's a little easier for the patient to recover motion. So these can be straightforward, these particular fractures, but they're not always because of those subacute or chronic fractures that have significant displacement and the percutaneous osteoclasis, as we have been taught in Boston and Philadelphia, uh, really can be an effective technique to uh, avoid or minimize the risk of AVN and obtain an anatomical reduction. So my takeaways, first, careful examination, uh, that includes clinical and x-rays, a conversation with the family and when appropriate, the child. Be aware of the complications to do your best to minimize the risks. And when you are in the operating room, keep things closed if possible. And then after you treat the child, always reassess and try to simulate wrist motion and try to simulate finger flexion with both tenodesis and squeezing the forearm. Thank you very much. That was excellent. A lot of um, important stuff covered in 10 minutes, as promised. Um, one question for you, Dr. Goldfarb. Um, what, when these are, we talked a lot about operatively treated fractures. The ones that are non-operatively treated, are there ever kids walking out of your office in a splint or is it always a cast? Are there any of these fractures when they're non-displaced that you would treat in a splint? Um, sure. I think it depends. I, I, I tend to cast kids under 10 years of age. Um, and I really put it on the family to make the decision, but I push them a little bit towards casting. Uh, in the right child, buddy taping and a splint can be totally reasonable, but I, I think you're rolling the dice a little bit. And I haven't ever had a family who participates in the decision for casting ever regret it. So I have a low threshold for casting. Yes, it's usually the parents that want the cast, right? So um, thank you. Okay, so going on to Dr. Jessica Hanley, um, who will be talking about pediatric wrist um, and forearm fractures, and she's coming to us from Children's in Wisconsin. Thank you, Dr. Hanley. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity um, to kind of talk to you today. Um, have a big charge of talking about wrist and forearm fractures, so I'll try to kind of keep it simple and hit the highlights, um, but there's a lot to cover in 10 minutes, but I'll do my best. I don't have any disclosures. Just a brief stop at anatomy, just quickly go over the epiphysis and the physis come, those are like the really big things that separate pediatric fractures, obviously from adults. Um, you know, looking at when the epiphysis appears in the distal radius is around one to two years and the distal ulna around five to seven years. Um, the physis or the growth plate um, in the distal radius, we always talk about premature closure and that's something that we really are concerned about a lot, especially around the wrist. Um, it gen generally closes around 16. The distal ulna tends to close a little bit sooner than the distal radius. And as you can see, it provides quite a bit of growth of that bone. And so that's why we're so, you know, worried about or thinking about that distal growth plate, because it does provide quite a bit of growth for that whole forearm. Um, let me see if I can advance. So just kind of going to briefly talk from very, very simple buccal fractures onto um, kind of the more complex or complicated fractures. Beginning with buccal fractures, this is kind of that axial lobe compressive force, just really just wrinkling that cortex. Um, it's the most common fracture. We see a ton of them. Um, and these are almost, they're, they are universally treated non-operatively. Um, two to three weeks, maybe in a cast, a uh, removable brace. There's a lot of literature to say that an ACE wrap is fine. I found in my practice, a lot of families really worry when I tell them we don't even need to immobilize this. So I end up putting a lot of kids in just short arm waterproof casts for a couple of weeks. Um, I think that helps the families feel a little bit less anxious about the fact that you're letting their kid walk out of your office without any mobilization for a fracture. Um, they are inherently stable, so you do not need to um, have any radiographs for following up um, to confirm healing. 
they're almost always uh, non-painful at around two weeks after you see them. Moving on to green stick, I think these fractures are, again, universally, um, you know, uh, unique to children. And so they are very different from the buccal fracture. Again, it's kind of that bending and partial cracking of the physis, or excuse me, of the peri, um, of the cortex. And so they are not, unlike, um, unlike uh, buccal fractures, they are not inherently stable. And so we do need to make sure that we're monitoring these. They may need a reduction. Most are supination injuries. And as we are all kind of taught in residency and training is kind of rotating the palm towards the deformity to kind of correct that. Um, and again, you can see there is a reasonable amount of displacement in these. So casting technique is important as um, you know, we'll see throughout this talk. Plastic deformation again is again, a very unique thing for children. Um, it's really a series of small fracture lines that you can't really detect on an X-ray where the bone is just stressed beyond that elastic limit. Um, the remodeling potential is quite minimal and unreliable. And so if there is a clinical deformity or there's, you know, an older patient or there's a, another fracture that is being prevented, um, you know, from healing or reduction being performed, we do recommend kind of close reduction and casting for these plastic deformations. Moving on to kind of complete fractures, starting with distal radius, non-displaced fractures, cast anywhere from between you know, three to six weeks. Again, I tend to cast a lot of kids just not because I don't trust them, but because I don't trust them. Um, usually a short arm cast is fine for our older patients. You'll find in younger patients, their arms are pretty chubby and they tend to slide right out of short arm cast. So you may need to consider a long arm cast. There is good evidence to say a well-molded short arm cast is equivalent to a long arm cast to prevent that, you know, rotational deformity or at least limit that pronosupination. Um, and I'm a pretty conservative person in terms of I worry about refracture. So after the cast, most of my kids are going into a wrist guard to prevent refracture. Um, I just, the last thing I want is to, you know, have a patient come back. I tell them they're healed and they return to their activities and they refracture. Um, displaced fractures, again, there's a lot of different treatment methods. It's very challenging to kind of decide sometimes, but we try to give these acceptable parameters for what is acceptable in a kid, what will remodel, what won't remodel. Um, and I think it's pretty controversial. And, you know, over time, you kind of get a gist of what might remodel, but it's hard to kind of make a hard and fast rule of what is um, going to remodel. So again, close reduction casting, usually done in the ER under sedation. We usually say under nine years old, bayonetting is acceptable, less than one uh, centimeter of shortening, angulation, and um, malrotation is acceptable as well. Um, and as you get older, you accept less and less. Again, well-molded cast is super important and bivalving if the reduction is performed in order to prevent you know, concerns about compartment syndrome or significant swelling. Um, I usually tend to see them back pretty quickly at around you know five to seven days in plaster, making sure nothing is shifted from my reduction. Um, and we do not, and we'll touch on this later about physeal fractures, but not um, reducing those if they are, are presenting late. Moving on to kind of closed reduction percutaneous pinning. These are for, again, more skeletally immature, usually patients that fail non-op or kind of fall off or have an unacceptable reduction. Usually kind of looking at using two small, sometimes one, sometimes three, um, smooth uh, radial styloid pins, trying to avoid the physis when you can. Sometimes it's uh, not possible given the nature of the fracture. Um, and always thinking about the radial sensory nerve and not wrapping that up in your K wires. Um, and usually do something along a long arm cast, depending on the fracture, and then transitioning to a short arm cast or a wrist guard. Um, open reduction and internal fixation, I usually reserve for older patients, those skeletally mature um, patients. Typical FCR approach roller plate is for a good majority of them. Obviously, we can go and deep dive into fixation of distal radius fractures, but We'll leave it at that for the sake of time. Um, and just to touch again, the physeal fractures are really important to not kind of overlook or miss or kind of under um, appreciate. Salter Harris too are the most common. Um, again, as I mentioned before, avoiding delayed or repeated reduction attempts because you don't do not want to cause further damage or prematurely arrest that growth plate. Um, if there is a previous ER reduction attempted, and it's not good enough, we just take them to the OR and get it fixed in the OR. 
Um, and every kid that has a fysial fracture, I like to follow at least six months into a year just to make sure that they're not having any growth rest that could cause, you know, the need for a future ulnar shortening, osteotomy, or problems down the line. So that's always something that we need to kind of be very cautious of in a kid. Moving on to the forearm, um, obviously can be fractures of both the radius and the ulna, could be a fracture of one bone with plastic deformation of the other. Non-displaced, you're going into a cast. Usually a cast is a little bit longer. They tend to be a little bit slower to heal. Um, and I just um, keep them in a long arm cast and often transition to a short arm cast for a couple of weeks. Displaced, again, going through closed reduction in casting, skeletal immature. Again, that same rule applies. The younger they are, the more you can accept Forearm, again, same concepts of the closer you are to the growth plate, the more remodeling potential that you have. And so as you move more proximal in the forearm, you're accepting less and less. Kids that are older, less than two years of growth remaining, essentially you can't accept any angulation. Um, good option for a lot of these younger patients um, tends to be that A, if you have an unacceptable close reduction, um, can be flexible nailing, um, either a closed or open reduction, depending on how easy it is to reduce those, um, and flexible nailing one or both of those bones, um, and going back later to remove those flexible nails. I usually do that around a year, at least at least six months. Um, and then in skeletally mature, you essentially treat them like an adult open reduction internal fixation, and depending on where you're at in the forearm, um, your approach may vary. Moving on to fracture dislocations, these are the ones that you're kind of really don't want to miss, and they often are missed, unfortunately, is these Montasia fractures. Um, can be a fracture of the ulna or a plastic, plastically deformed ulna that kind of pushes the radial head out. Um, the beta, the beta classification, kind of anterior dislocation to type 1, is the most common. Usually, if you reduce the ulna, the radial head follows along. It doesn't always occur that way, but I'm pretty aggressive with treating these just because I hate to have them fall off or miss them, or, you know, you kind of have to recognize these pretty quickly. Um, and there are some people that fix almost all of these. So again, it's really important to get good radiographs. I know people are very worried about getting x-rays in kids. I just want to make sure I'm treating the patient appropriately, making sure you have good x-rays. They don't have a good lateral. You can kind of see on these x-rays, it's a little hard to tell on the forearm films, but when you look at the lateral, it's pretty obvious that that radial head is not located. Um, and I've seen people who had, oh, you have a congenital radial head dislocation, especially in the scenario where the ulna is actually not broken, but it's plastically deformed. It's a little challenging to appreciate that. Um, kind of the opposite end of the spectrum is those Galeazzi fractures. They're a little less common in skeletally immature patients, um, usually a distal third radius fracture. Then you kind of get a dislocation of the ulna. There are variants in children where basically there's a physeal um, fracture through the distal ulnar physis. Um, TFCC is disrupted. Oftentimes can be treated with closed reduction and long arm casting to prevent pronosupination and often are either um, positioned in full supination or a neutral position to help with the stability of that TFCC. Um, and again, oftentimes if you're not getting that reduction, you may need to open them. The ulna may be buttonholed through the periosteum and consider K-wearing across the DRUJ temporarily to kind of stabilize that. Complications, again, this could be a whole nother talk in and of itself, but refracture, as we mentioned, um, I didn't put it on here, but premature physeal arrest of the distal radius is one of them as well. Malunions, compartment syndromes, any neurovascular injury, and then synostosis, especially as you get more proximal in the forearm. Um, so kind of, ran through everything, but kind of take home points to consider are really making sure when you're choosing a treatment, whether that be operative or non-operative, you're really taking into consideration the amount of fracture displacement, where the fracture is, and the skeletal maturity of the patient, not necessarily the age, because I've seen some very mature 12-year-olds, and I've seen very immature 18 or 16-year-olds, so really just thinking about where their bone is um, in their maturity. Um, and as Dr. Goldfarb mentioned, you can't always just say they're going to do great. They're going to do fine. They're a kid. They'll remodel everything. Again, remodeling occurs best in that plane of motion. Um, rotational deformities, plastic deformation really have a hard time or really have a limited potential for remodeling. Um, and again, that adage of closer to the growth plate, younger the patient, the more remodeling potential. And I think this goes without saying, but you want to treat the family. You want to treat the patient. 
the activity level of the patient. Some of these kids really need to be pushed um, with their motion and moving. Some kids, you need to wrap them in bubble wrap and put them in the closet because they're they are too active. So that may dictate whether you want to put them in a cast or a splint. Um, and then the anxiety of the caretaker dis discussing some people really are worried about things a lot more. So you kind of have to have that conversation when you're choosing which treatment you're going to go with for your patients. So, um, and that's all I got. There's my two little ones. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, so one quick question again, as we're turning over, um, the the younger children with dis, uh, distal radius, metaphyseal distal radius fractures that we know from like the Crawford paper in Hawaii that we could treat with complete bayonet apposition um, at our institution are still always getting a closed reduction in the emergency room. Are you ever just having a conversation with the families and not even trying a reduction for those really young kids where you know really that they would remodel? Yeah, I think it's it's a hard conversation. Yeah, I think it's a hard conversation to have with those families when you're you're presenting them an X-ray and they have you know they're looking at it and they can see the fracture and they're like you're gonna leave that alone. I think it's a it's a conversation with them and if they're you know pretty accepting of that, there are times where I'm saying yeah that's okay it might be re good to remodel but I usually tend to send those kids if they're within a time frame where I think it's acceptable, we send them to get a, a reduction in the ER or take them to the OR. Um, but again, if you know it's more than about a week out or two weeks or you're already starting to see healing, I don't think um, it's wrong to leave those. Again, it is a little hard to convince the parents sometimes that it's gonna look okay. Yeah, absolutely. It's a hard conversation. Um, thank you. All right, moving up the skeleton. So Dr. Stephanie Russo will be talking to us about pediatric elbow fractures and she is coming to us from Akron Children's. Thank you, Dr. Bauer and Dr. Jane for the opportunity to present tonight and all of the other presenters who have given great talks already and to come. Um, so again, it's a big topic. I'm gonna focus on a few different uh, elbow fractures um, that we see pretty regularly. So we'll dive right in. This is a 12 year old that presented with this uh, displaced supracondylar humerus fracture after getting her arm pinned under the roll bar of uh, a four wheeler. Um, and I think when you see these, the exam is really critical. Um, so you want to observe them, look at the skin, look for that ecchymosis or skin puckering anteriorly that can suggest that proximal fragment has pierced through the brachialis. In this patient, you can see the fracture blisters that were substantial in the anterior um, anticubital fossa here. Um, looking at the coloration of the hand, the capillary refill, and a detailed neurovascular exam for any neurologic deficit, uh, loss of pulses, um, et cetera, and, and then as well as any other concomitant fractures of the forearm or other injuries associated with these. Um, uh, timing remains controversial for uh, treatment of supracondylar humerus fractures. Most of them can probably wait until the next morning, depending on when they come in, but some factors that may push you to the OR a bit sooner are if it's an open fracture, uh, if it's a fully disvascular limb, for sure. Um, peak pulses is a relative indication. Um, if you have signs concerning for evolving compartment syndrome, median nerve palsy has been suggested as having the potential to mask a compartment syndrome and might uh, push you towards the OR sooner um, in patients that have uh, unreliable exam. Um, when you reduce these, a couple of things that I like to look for is kind of restoration of this isosceles triangle between the epicondyles and the olecranon, um, as well as the patient's fingers should be able to touch their shoulder. And if you can't reach there yet, they're probably not uh, fully reduced if it's extension type. Um, and then we often talk about two pins for type twos, three pins for type threes. So coming in as the Monday morning quarterback in this one, um, it's probably not as divergent in either plane as it could be across the pins and the spread across the um, fracture uh, perhaps could be a little bit farther. Um, and when she got to me, this is uh, how she looks. So you can see a little bit further displacement uh, despite having three pins in this type three. Um, so some of the factors that are associated with loss of reduction after pinning is if the pin exits through the fracture site, if the pin is not bicortical, um, or if the pins cross or are too close together at uh, the fracture. 
in general, it's been fairly well demonstrated at this point that lateral pins provide adequate stability for uh, supracondylar fractures. Um, there are occasional situations where you might use a medial pin. Um, in this case, it was referred uh, probably a better lateral construct might have prevented the need for a medial pin. Um, and that pin migrated and then went back to the OR for uh, pin removal. And at some point in this whole process, the ulnar nerve was transected. So certainly those medial pin uh, can be used in some situations, but is not uh, benign. Um, and then times when you may need an open reduction instead of closed reduction for these, or if it's already an open fracture, if it's irreducible, you're concerned for um, some type of soft tissue interposed at the fracture site. Um, there's been some papers that suggest that if you have both median nerve and a vascular compromise, there's a relatively high rate of those uh, structures being entrapped at the fracture sites and may warrant exploration. And certainly if the limb remains dysvascular after reduction. Um, this uh, patient that we've been going through was uh, discharged home after her pinning with a prescription for oxycodone and came back to the office uh, with her forearm, wrist, and fingers fixed in this posture. Um, and she unfortunately had a uh, missed compartment syndrome. So in general for these, uh, uh, over-the-counter pain medication should be adequate. And the important thing to remember for kids is that they don't often don't present with the P's that we think about for compartment syndrome. And you want to look for the A's with increasing analgesic need being the most, uh, um, the earliest finding and then that agitation and anxiety along with that. Um, so moving on to lateral condyle fractures, these can be challenging to visualize on x-rays at time. The thing to remember for these is the internal oblique view. So you can see a very subtle fracture on the uh, left two images, but that internal oblique gives you a much better picture of displacement in this case. Um, and I really like the Weiss classification for these fractures, which I think helps to guide treatment as well as complications. Um, if you have a type one fracture with less than two millimeters of displacement, most of them would be amenable to uh, cast immobilization, um, but they should get serial radiographs for at least two, maybe three weeks afterwards to make sure it's not displacing. I personally will often take them out of the cast for the repeat x-rays to make sure that you can see the fracture line and comparing each week to the original x-rays so that if there's some subtle displacement along the way, you're not missing the total amount of displacement over time. And then the type twos and threes have more than two millimeters of displacement, either with or without an intact articular hinge. And unless that fragment is rotated way out to the side, it usually requires an arthrogram to distinguish between these. Um, and that uh, image on the left is showing you the way that I like to perform the arthrogram going straight into the posterior aspect of the olecranon fossa. Um, and then you want to assess the uh, articular cartilage um, to decide for um, closed or open reduction. Uh, if the cartilage is intact, uh, then a close reduction is typically adequate or minimal displacement. And again, it's two to three divergent bicortical pins. Um, for these, I usually like to place the first one perpendicular to the fracture line, and that second one is pretty transverse, almost you know, parallel with the articular surface. Um, and then again, uh, sometimes repeating if the dye has started to dissipate the contrast for the arthrogram afterwards to confirm your reduction. If you do need to open these, um, any lateral approach is acceptable. Oftentimes the dissection has already been done by the fracture. Um, and the main thing to remember is to avoid posterior dissection so you don't compromise the vascularity of the capitellum. Um, and restoring the articular congruity is the main objective here. There can sometimes be comminution or plastic deformity about the metaphyseal component. Um, and so that may not perfectly line up, but what your main goal is to get the articular surface lined up for these open reductions. And this can take a little bit longer to heal. Um, the pins generally stay in until you can see cow's formation on all the x-ray views, which tends to be around six weeks. Um, and they uh, can be a little bit slower to regain elbow range of motion than a supracondylar humerus fracture or some other fractures are. Um, there's also a number of complications associated with lateral condyles, the most common of which is lateral overgrowth that can give a various appearance to the elbow. Um, and this is approaching 100% of operative cases. So it's something that I always talk to parents about before surgery so that they are not surprised or upset by it afterwards. Um, and then you can also have non-union with a lateral condyle fracture or vari various growth disturbances, including a lateral 
uh, growth arrested the lateral aspect of the humerus that leads to cubitus valgus deformity and tardy ulnar nerve palsy over time. Um, and there's an example of that uh, non-union and um, lateral growth arrest. And so then moving to the other side of the elbow for medial epicondyl fractures, this is a 14 year old baseball player who presented with two to three weeks of uh, medial elbow pain followed by feeling a pop and immediate pain and swelling uh, while throwing during baseball practice. And um, I think it's important to remember with these that it's sometimes difficult to assess the displacement on x-rays. So you can see these uh, two x-rays on the left that look like a non-displaced fracture, but that uh, medial epicondyle is displaced a good centimeter anteriorly on the CT scan that you can't really appreciate on the x-rays. Um, and management of these is relatively controversial. Non-operative management has been suggested for everything up to about two centimeters of displacement. My personal preference for these is that if I have any concern that it was an elbow dislocation that spontaneously reduced, I will take them to the OR for exam under anesthesia and fix the fracture if the elbow is unstable. Other reasons to go to the OR would be if the medial epicondyle is incarcerated in the joint, um, if it's a throwing or an upper extremity weight-bearing athlete, such as a, a pitcher or a gymnast that's going to be putting a lot of stress across their elbow, they will likely do better with uh, fixation in many cases. And this is an example of a patient with that medial epicondyl fracture. You can see the substantial ecchymosis it looks more than you might expect from a um, avulsion fracture. And you can see that gross instability in the OR prior to fixation. Um, I like to fix these in usually the lateral decubitus position to try to take that valgus stress off of the elbow um, while you're getting it reduced and fixed. Um, a screw fixation, cannulate screw is most common for these. It's usually like a four or 4.5 millimeter screw in many cases, um, and they do not need to be bicortical. Um, so this is a patient that was referred for a radial nerve palsy after fixation of the uh, medial epicondyle, and you can see that end of the screw on the uh, top picture, and likely it was the drill bit uh, that uh, caused the injury to the radial nerve in this case. Um, so this I learned from Dr. Bauer, so hopefully I get it right, that um, this concept of more fractures with uh, medial epicondyle, olecranon, and radial neck being associated with more injury or an elbow dislocation, that uh, there may be more than meets the eye when you're looking at these x-rays, so just to keep that in mind when you're seeing these injury patterns which brings us segue into trash lesions. Um, so that stands for the radiographic appearance seemed harmless. There's many different types of fracture patterns that fall under this umbrella, but some of the more common ones are an elbow dislocation in a patient under the age of 10, which should raise concern for the possibility of an intraarticular osteochondral fragment and additional imaging to assess for that. If the patient's under the age of three, you should be thinking about a transphyseal fracture because a true elbow dislocation in that age group is very uncommon. And then another pattern that often results in this is a compression fracture on the anterior aspect of the radial head that has very subtle posterior subluxation initially that is progressive over time. And this uh, panel shows an example of that where that posterior subluxation becomes more apparent in B and is confirmed in the uh, MRI at the bottom and then ultimately the fixation. And so the key for these is really having a high index of suspicion with these injury patterns, a very low threshold for getting advanced imaging for further assessment and aggressive operative management of both the bony and soft tissue structures as needed to restore stability to the elbow. And it's certainly easier to do this uh, early rather than trying to salvage them later. Um, so in summary, uh, I think close inspection of the patient on physical exam and imaging is important. Having a high index of suspicion for some of these fractures that can be bad actors, while the vast majority will do well, as I think all of us have said so far today, there are ones that go wrong and when they go wrong, they can go very wrong. So trying to be aware of those making your uh, treatment plan uh, carefully and, um, and following them for an adequate amount of time to uh, pick up and address any issues that occur afterwards. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you so much, Dr. Russo. Um, so um, finally, we'll be moving on to Josh McDonald who will talk to us about how to rehab all of these injuries after um, our very short amount of time in the OR, what is, can often be a long amount of time in rehab. Um, just as we're pulling this up, um, 
One question I want to go through in the chat is um, whether, um, Dr. Russo, whether you routinely remove the cannulated screw after medial epicondyle fixation. Uh, I, I don't routinely remove it unless it's symptomatic um, or if the patient was really young, but usually it's more in an adolescent. And um, I think the rate in the literature is somewhere around 30% or so that can be uh, symptomatic and require removal. But if it's not bothering them, I leave it. Great. Okay. So last but not least, Josh McDonald is a hand therapist at Hand Therapy Partners in Phoenix, Arizona, and he'll be talking to us about occupational therapy for all of these pediatric upper extremity injuries. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for all the uh, presenters. A lot of great information we've covered so far. Um, basically wanted to go over some things that we do in pediatric therapy for these kiddos who've had fractures, um, acute traumas. Um, there's a whole different kind of therapy that we're doing for these kids. It's not just smaller adults. So my biggest take home would be if you're referring kids out to a place to do therapy, if they're one of those small, small population that um, Dr. Goldfarb talked about needing therapy, that um, you find a place to send those referrals that is comfortable with pediatrics, not just a therapist who happens to have their own kids, um, but a therapist that is comfortable and has done pediatrics in the past, ideally has a dedicated place to see these kids because there's a whole other gamut of things that you have to consider. Um, so we'll go over some of those things here. Um, one is the obviously the variations in diagnosis and precautions. Uh, we've talked a lot about um, uh, growth plate fractures and those kind of things, but even just knowing um, the different diagnoses that could be embedded in some of those other things, uh, whether we're talking about maybe diagnoses of Madelung's deformity, someone who, uh, a therapist who needs to be comfortable with the broad variety of things that we could be looking at, um, because if those kids come through and that therapist is not familiar with those things, then they're they're not um, as experienced in dealing with the family and educating, because a lot of times the therapists are the ones that are going to spend a fair amount of time educating the families on what these diagnoses mean long term, what a fracture complication can mean long term and their options and some of those things, helping them kind of debrief what the uh, what the surgeon may have given them on follow up visits, helping to make sense of that. So lots of different things for for a therapist to try to consider with this family and with the individual with the with the patient themselves. Um, Developmental milestones, as we do therapy with patients, um, we have to understand that these developmental milestones act as an overlay to all of our treatment. Um, we know that when kids, you talk to someone in child life in the hospitals, we know that when kids go through a major trauma, especially if it involves any significant hospital stay, they will go back developmental stages. They may lose skills that they just acquired, like uh, potty training, developmental skills, like gross motor skills, fine motor skills. So we have to understand what to expect next in their sequencing given that they may have lost some skills that they're trying to reacquire, social skills, language skills, those kind of things. I need to know that if I have an 18 month old who grabbed the knife off the counter and lacerated FPL, that normally in an adult, I would be working on pincer skills later on when, once I clear their precautions. But with an 18 month old, I wouldn't expect that as a developmentally normal grasp. So that's not something I'd be able to do to elicit that, um, that motor function out of that mu uh, muscle unit. So I need to know what's normal to expect out of the developmental timeline so I know how to plan a treatment session to elicit what we're going to get out of it. I should be shaping my treatment session with those developmental sequences in mind, not just picking things that I think are going to use the hands in a functional way. I'm going to adjust my assessment tools and my expectations. We'll talk about this a little bit as we get a little closer uh, on the next slide, but I need to know that I'm not going to sit down across the table from that patient like a normal um, hand therapy session. I need to get down on the floor. I need to be doing play with that kid. I need to be, we'll talk about establishing rapport. They need to know that they can trust me because I'm going to see them on a regular basis. And if I start off like every other medical professional by just doing things to them, then they're going to set up this standard wall that kids will do to protect themselves from pain and stress and trauma. So I need to know that my assessment sessions, I may not lay hands on the kid for 15, 20, maybe 30 minutes just to gain their trust. I need to know that I have the trust of the parent. I need to know that I have that kid's uh, rapport built up. So my assessment may not look normal, um, may not look like a typical assessment sitting across the table doing goniometry and dynamometry, that kind of stuff. Um, I know I need to know whether or not this patient from the surgeon's perspective is one that's likely needed long-term therapy because like the, um, Dr. Goldfarb had mentioned, a lot of these kids are going to be just fine without therapy and they don't need to come to us. But when they do get to us, it's typically because there's maybe some greater concern. So it's helpful for us to know from the surgeon 
hey, this is one that we see maybe one of these trash uh, fractures that um, the last doctor was talking about where we don't know what's going on. Give us some feedback. What are you seeing with stability of a joint after a fracture? Um, we need to know, like, is this just, hey, the kid got stiff unexpectedly or there's something else we're, we're looking for? Um, or does the patient need a splint? Maybe after casting, they need to transition to a splint for recess time or gym class or just playing with their brother and sister. Or do they need something to protect that site because kids make bad choices, they play rough, they don't understand implications. So some of those things may be um, uh, are helpful for us to know coming from the surgeon's perspective. We also know that from a therapy perspective, we're not just dealing with uh, uh, like a small person as far as like, oh, well, we can teach them about the injury and teach them precautions. These kids have their own emotional and behavioral needs. And because as therapists, we're seeing them on a regular basis two, maybe three times a week early on, we have to establish a great rapport with them so that they can trust us so that when I tell them, hey, watch out for that or careful, don't do that. Or now you're allowed to do this because now we're kicking them out of the nest a little bit that they can trust that we're looking out for their best intentions. And that starts with me just kind of playing with them on the floor and establishing that um, that relationship with them. But I'm also not dealing just with the um, with the kiddo. We know we're always dealing with the parent as well. And so I know that I need to establish a rapport with a kid and the parent educating both and teaching on the kid level for them and their precautions and when they can um, be free of them, but also with a, with a parent and letting them know that this is going to be okay. Here's our normal expected timeline. Here's what to expect with this kind of injury. So dealing with not just a patient, like with an adult situation, but also with kids establishing it's the patient and the parent, not just that patient that we're dealing with. So making sure we have a rapport, that rapport building is crucial. Like I said, I may not actually like manage and hands-on and goniometry for 15, 20 minutes. If I'm making a splint on a kid that's maybe three or four, they don't understand that hot is okay if it's just warm. If something's on their hand and it feels a little warm, they're going to freak out and think it's going to burn them because they've learned hot is danger. So I may play with like a little piece of thermoplast that I've warmed up and I let them hang on to it and touch it and feel it and be like, oh, we can shape it around my hand or their other hand. And we take time establishing that so that the fabrication process goes way simpler. It's just a whole different mindset when working um, with pediatrics for a therapy perspective. Um, talking about our specific assessments, uh, our range of motion measurements are going to be very different. It is so hard to get normal goniometry on a um, like a, anyone under the age of four who's gone through this kind of trauma. They're nervous about anyone in the medical profession. They're nervous about anyone coming at them with hands-on stuff. Um, so I may be doing more like kind of this eyeball based on my experience test, but that happens when this kid is in constant movement around the room. And so I'm giving them something like, hey, here's a Cheerio, do you want a snack? And as they grab that, I'm looking for that digit range of motion. And I may pull out a goniometer and hold it off to the side while they're doing that. And I'm trying to you know, simulate that range. I may film a session if I get approval from the family and say like, hey, if I can just set up a camera and I can go back and do like we did during telehealth measurements from a screen and get the best I can with those goniometry measurements. Um, knowing sensory testing is is completely different in kids. I can't do monofilament unless they're four years or older. Can't do two-point discrimination unless they're six years or older. They just don't cognitively understand what I'm asking of them. I can do wrinkle tests and nine hydrant tests, but those get super clunky and awkward. You know, you're doing water play for 10 to 15 minutes and in a clinic setting, that just gets a little hairy sometimes. So it can be difficult to do that sensory testing. Honestly, we're looking for functional skills with them. If I hand them something that's got a texture, do they notice it? Maybe I'm handing them something that kind of subtly has a texture that they wouldn't necessarily notice, but they hold it and think, oh, that's scratchy. Do they pick up on that? Do they notice that in that hand when I hand them something? Or I put something on, like they bring a stuffed animal. I put something on that stuffed animal and say, can you feel that? And see if they notice that it feels different than it should. So sometimes it's just that environmental testing that we're looking at. I need to know their developmental milestones as I'm doing assessments. We talked about like a pincer grasp. I need to know grasp patterns. I need to know what they would normally do socially in play skills and play development to say like, am I going to give them something that's, you know, a choking hazard? Am I going to give them something that's an appropriate fit for where they are developmentally? So a pediatric hand therapy specialist should have something along the lines of a toy cupboard that they have a variety of things they pull out for the four-year-old, the eight-year-old, the 10-year-old, the two-year-old, and a variety of things that I can show parents how to play at home to duplicate this stuff to get that home program simulated. And then our goals, priorities, and expectations are also significantly different. 
Um, my goal is to get this kid back to normal developmental play skills that may or may not look like full 100% function by the time they discharge from me. They may get far enough that we know, hey, they're going to be fine, but they're better off developing normally outside of the clinic setting. So it may be that I'm going to see them until the family has a great solid home program, and then we back off to once a month because in school, maybe with grandma who's watching them, they're going to develop a way more comfortable progression than coming to a, a clinic setting that's not their normal natural setting where things are just, um, they're, they're out of their normal environment. So sometimes kids will develop quicker if they're in their normal environment more consistently. Um, a couple of quick fun videos here. Basically, we're doing as much as we can with functional game-based stuff. And so um, like in this example, Dr. Hagrid did a fantastic review of different proprioceptive inputs and how that elicits improvement in wrist fractures, um, wrist injuries, those kind of things. So using an iPad for a labyrinth game, using um, using an iPad for games that are like um, writing on a virtual vertical surface, getting them doing developmentally normal things. They'd write on a chalkboard or a whiteboard up front of them in front of class, getting them comfortable with grass patterns, um, resistance up in space, working on endurance. I'm not doing weights. I'm not doing pulleys. I'm doing functional tasks that are within their normal setting just to get them comfortable with things. And so we have fun little toys we pull out that get them moving, active, dynamic, because kids aren't typically going to just, just sit at a table with us. So I want them moving a lot, being very active and doing things that are fun and engaging and things that just require way more grasp strength, but in a way that gets them not even thinking about grasp, but they're thinking about the object, the toy, the activity. And then by default, kind of in their mind, secondarily, they're working on that grasp strength and grasp function. So just a couple of fun videos to add to all of that. That's all I have for on this one. Wow, that was so that was so great. Thank you so much. I um, love working with my the therapist that I work with at, at work. You know, you can always say there's always a fun thing like this. And, and I really appreciate your saying that those those games, those toys are important for children um, and to really look for therapists that are open to doing to using those techniques and uh, finding ways um, to get children involved aside from sitting across from a table and working with some weights. Um, so thank you. Those were really awesome videos. Um, so I think we have answered our chat questions um, and we are just over time. So I just want to thank all of our presenters from uh, this evening and thank you to all of our participants who stuck with us for the last um, over the last hour and just want to turn it back over to Dr. Jane. Uh, th thanks, Andy. A wonderful job moderating, by the way. Incredible questions. And thank you to our speakers. Uh, really, really wonderful talks. I'd like to thank the audience for spending your night with us. Um, and uh, please join us on uh, Tuesday, September 19th for our inaugural uh, combined global hand-in-hand -hand webinar series with the Colombian Association for Surgery of the Hand, Sosimano. Uh, we're going to be talking about hand spasticity. Good night. Thank you.